I hope you all had a good break. Um, can you all hear me okay? Great. Um, so yeah, let's get um, started from where we left off. So we looked at, at the throne of uh, throne room of God and everything that uh, goes on there, and that there's continuous worship and an uh, intercession happening uh, in the very throne room of God. And 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 then, and, and a note from there is how how our churches here on earth should kind of emulate the same. Right? So let worship and for worship and intercession to be on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, um, let's look at the, some of the moments of prayer and worship that's happened uh, in history. Right, and one is uh, at the bottom of page ninety-three. Uh, we see we read about uh, Alexander Archimedes uh, and the sleepless ones. What that's what his team was known as. <laughs> Um, so around 400 AD, a monk named Alexander Archimedes gathered between 300 and 400 monks in Constantinople, where he established La Perenis, which simply means a continual prayer. Right? Uh, this is this he did that to fulfill Paul's exhortation to pray without ceasing in First Thessalonians chapter five verse seventeen. Um, right? So they were driven from constantinople the monks established a monastery at gorman uh, at the mouth of the black sea this became the founding monastery for the order of akumedi literally the sleepless ones um, and so this is again uh, uh, going around the clock uh, prayer 24 hours seven days a week so that is one of the moments uh, and the other one which is the most uh, prominent and a very famous movement in history uh, is of the is the moment of the Moravians, right? Moravians uh, in 1727, uh, founded by uh, Zinzendorf, right? It, it happened a, in a small village kind of setting in Germany, right? which are known as a Huren hut. So basically, uh, uh, he put he gathered together uh, 24 women and 24 men to pray round the clock right for just to uh, have that cycle of prayer as what we would call it right the prayer chain as you know i've seen some of the churches kind of follow that now uh, so he had it uh, back then in the 17th century itself um and and what amazed me uh, is that that movement went on for a hundred years Right, this prayer meeting uh, would go on for non-stop, non-stop, twenty-four hours, day after day, week after week, for uh, for a hundred years. That was must have been an amazing move of God, isn't it, in history? Um, right, and then uh, we uh, we all we've all read about or learned a little bit about uh, David Yongicho, um, and he did the same thing. Uh, some. Uh, Established something called the Prayer Mountain in Seoul, South Korea, uh, with night and day prayer. Uh, prayer Mountain was soon attracting over a million visitors per year, as people would spend retreats uh, in the prayer cells provided on the mountain. Um, right, and so that kind of led to uh, his church growing exponentially. Uh, this is again in the 70s and the 80s. It became a huge talk isn't it uh, how this church in south korea is growing at an exponential rate uh, and all of that at the root of it was going after uh, you know the heart of god pressing in for more and and his and the, and the in his house being a house of prayer and intercession and that lead that led to the growth of the church now growth is always uh, it could be more christians being added or it could be so many non christians who've given their lives and they are being added to the church right so that's another movement and one of uh, in the present days one of the most popular movements uh, is the uh, international house of prayer uh, that is hap that is located in kansas city the united states uh, right so in, uh, also known as ihop uh, International House of Prayer. So uh, let me just uh, share uh, of what that 
I'm sure most of you have already seen it or know what IHOP is, but then I thought we'll just take a look at it. That was just a quick, uh, you know, snippet of uh, the International House of Prayer. What goes on there? And um, in your notes, you'd see it was started in September nineteenth of nineteen ninety nine. Nineteen ninety nine, two thousand nine, two thousand nineteen, uh, and worship and prayer and intercession has been going on and on since that day, September 19th, and it still goes on. So what I played for us is a live feed of what is happening at the House of Prayer. Uh, so started off in a small room uh, with a few people and, and it just turned out to be this incredible movement uh, in the 2000s. Um, and yeah, and I've been blessed immensely uh, by that ministry. I just immensely, immensely uh, by their worship, uh, challenged by their lifestyle, uh, etc. And also, uh, we've uh, there is another ministry here in Bangalore called Face to Face uh, Foundations. Uh, when, when they started uh, in 2010, 2011. And so we've had a couple of moments uh, of not throughout, but then uh, we used to do this 24 hours of a worship we did that we did that for one week and we did it for two weeks uh and we did it for three weeks and uh let me tell you it's a uh, has uh, it, it might sound great I said, wow one week of just prayer and worship it sounds it, it is great trust me it's awesome but it's also very physically tasking uh very very tasking uh and you know if it's um especially if you don't have enough people um to roster and just go around the clock right uh you can't go uh you can't go you know approach a set in a house of prayer or something like that with a say a set of a song a four set song list you know i have four songs or five songs uh we can't because some of the worship sets will go on for three hours or four hours and so what are you going to do hey, but then uh it is challenging it it can get tiring but then it's just a beautiful ex beautiful experience um to just be part of it i can only imagine how david's tabernacle would have looked like and seemed like isn't it uh right so and day and night is another uh we see in isaiah chapter 62 6 and 7 uh, i have set watchmen on your walls O jerusalem they shall never hold their peace day or night you who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. I give him no rest till he establishes and till he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Luke 18 verse 1 and verse 7 says, Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? I like this Psalm 134 verse 1 to 3. Um, psalm 134, uh, I'm not sure if I've mentioned this, is the conclusion, concluding psalm of a series of 14 psalms from Psalm 120 to Psalm 114, uh, 34. If you see, they will be titled as Songs of Ascent. 
So, so uh, I'm, I'm sure there were more songs, but Psalm 120 to Psalm 134 will be titled as Songs of Ascent. That means they would sing those songs as they were ascending up the hill of the Lord to reach the sanctuary. Right. So, and Psalm 34 is like the conclusion of it, uh, the series of Psalms. And then it says, Bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. That means day and night there's worship happening. So lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord who made the heavens and the earth bless you from Zion. Um, right, so and then the notes goes on to say, "Let us become a people who will cry out to God uh, day and night, uh, night and day." Um, uh, I'm sure most of you have been part of, say, uh, all night prayer sometime at least in your life. Uh, there's something different and beautiful about it, isn't it? Uh, it's challenging. Uh, no, but then uh, it's just it's something about it, right? Um, so establishing a house of prayer and worship, all ministry that flows out such a lifestyle of intimacy with God uh, through prayer and worship will be powerful, right? Uh, so how can we implement uh, this in our local churches? Simple, teach people to understand the importance of prayer and worship. We need to talk more about prayer. We need to teach our people more about prayer uh, and worship. Uh, worship, I think we, we speak about it uh, in the last 20 years. We, we have spoken a lot about worship than on prayer. Uh, it's what it seems like. Uh, but then we need to teach and help people understand the importance of prayer and worship. Develop the local church in prophetic worship and powerful strategic prayer and intercession. Like strategic prayer so in the previous chapter last week's class we learned that the local church is the army and the army is always strategic right they have a strategic plan of when to attack when not to attack where to go and what to do etc right and we saw that how david constantly uh, it, the scripture says he inquired of the lord he inquired of the lord he inquired of the lord what to do next and right so we need to be strategic uh, you know uh, about about taking ground, so collecting strategic information of things, for example, social problems, demonic strongholds are happening in your city or community, and make these your prayer targets. Right? This is practical ways of uh, how a local church can implement this. Right? Uh, challenges, uh, progress step by step, start where people are. Do not try to jump immediately into something 24 bar 7 house of prayer. Okay, uh, don't, don't uh, try to do that if you don't have, if you have not planned properly or if you do not have sufficient people, uh, don't jump immediately into something like that. Uh, before we did this 24 hours for seven days, uh, we, we waited for 10, 11 months to put together a team to plan a facility uh, until we got a place where we could meet. Uh, until all the equipments were there, the finances, the funds, funds will come, but then, you know, you need to have people and, and a plan, right? Uh, give people time to rest physically as well. Now, engaging in extended hours of worship and intercession can be physically tiring for those who are involved in leading in worship and intercession. Okay, so those are the couple of challenges that uh, you will come across, uh, you know, when, when you want to do something like this for like a 24 hours. Uh, prayer and worship thing but then that's nevertheless that is something that we ought to push for uh, aim for reach for you know uh, teach and in our in our churches so that our churches uh, at the local church will be known uh, as the church of prayer right and worship right um, hey are you guys doing well yeah okay there's one thumbs up <laughs> that I can see uh right isaac uh everybody doing all right lyndon subashish okay right, any thoughts any questions so far uh on this chapter that we've covered are you all learning something i hope you are and i hope it's not just information i am um just this morning i was as i was preparing for today's sessions i was um i was just feeling very grateful i was like you know wow i'm getting to learn all these things as in it's just so awesome so i'm grateful that i'm 
learning, getting to learn as I'm teaching. And so uh, it's the same with you guys. I hope you are uh, learning as well as you are growing. OK, cool. So um, let's move on um, to the next chapter, chapter 14. Um, the other aspect of the local church is the temple of God. The local church is the temple of God, right? So everything that we've covered so far, the local church is the body of Christ. The local church is the family of God. The local church is the pillar of truth. The local church is the army. The local church is the bride. The local church is a house of prayer and worship. And now we are at the local church is a temple of God. Okay. Um, First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defies the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, uh, which temple you are. Right. So very often uh, this verse is being uh, what is being you this verse is used to uh, uh, to challenge someone to live a holy life as for as individually, right? If if anyone is suffering with sin or whatnot, you just kind of remind them it's like, hey, you're the temple of the living God. So don't drink, uh, don't smoke. Uh, don't watch pornography. Uh, so it, it's at least that's what I know of. Okay, maybe it was used in different uh, in a context in your life, but in my life it was not used. <laughs> okay, uh, but so yes, it is. Uh, it is for you know, it is true when it comes for individual application. But Paul is also writing to a local community of believers. Believers, right? So that's his audience. Right, Paul is addressing here not to an individual but to a community of believers. Right, it's a, it's a collective. Right, so hence the the context addresses a collective body of believers. Right, so we are the temple of God, the place where God dwells. Okay, so we are not the temple of God for the sake of you know. Okay, it's a temple of God, but the whole thing changes. The perspective changes when we realize that God dwells there right uh, we are a habitation of god we must be filled with his presence because we are his temple and so when we look at the tabernacle of moses once again so uh we look at it quite extensively uh god instructed moses to build the tabernacle right exodus chapter 25 uh he says let them make me a sanctuary for what Let them make me a sanctuary for what? <laughs> Exodus 25, verse 8. Sorry, what? To dwell among them. To dwell among them. Open book uh, exam this. Okay. <laughs> uh, it, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Okay, so I'm um, not sure again if I mentioned this, but then uh, from the time of the fall, okay, uh, in, in the early chapters of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, when we see from the time of creation and God creates Adam uh, and Eve, we see that he walked with them in the cool of the garden, right? He, he dwelt among them. There was a fellowship, right? There was oneness. As soon as after the fall, when sin came and there was a separation, right? So from that point on from that point on all the way to exodus 25 i mean uh, there's a lot of things happening from genesis from genesis 3 to exodus 25 right you you read about cain and abel and adam and eve and noah his family and abraham isaac and jacob right that's Exodus and Joseph and whatnot. So a lot has happened from Genesis 3 to Exodus 25. So the, the timeline, the gap between that is approximately 2,500 years. So for 2,500 odd years, there was no resting place or a dwelling place for God. And time and time again, you see God, there was visitations, 
right? Uh, God would speak to Abraham, you, you know, and all of that. The visitations was there, but there was no resting place on earth like it was before the fall. And so 2,500 years or later, he tells them, finally, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So the tabernacle of Moses is the meeting place. Uh, it's the It was the bridge between heaven and earth where divinity met with humanity. Okay, so it was just, it, it was just, must have been glorious, right? Just to learn, uh, just to have that picture, um, right? So you, you see all about it in Exodus 25, 21, 22. Um, it says, the tabernacle was a place where the glory of God would be visible from time to time. It was the glory of God that sanctified the tabernacle. In Exodus 29, verse 43, it says, And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And then in Exodus 40, verse 34, 35, it says, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Right? Um, and so we see that time and time again, uh, in even in Israel's journey through the wilderness, uh, you read about it in Leviticus, Numbers, uh, and all those chapters mentioned there, that the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. One of the things of the tabernacle of Moses is, I mean, uh, is there's the outer courts, the inner courts, and the holy place, isn't it? That's that it was it was divided into three sections, right? The outer courts, uh, in the outer courts, there was natural light, the light of the sun, and you know, the moonlight by night, uh, and then in the inner courts, there's the light of the candle uh, lampstand, the golden lampstand. There was a golden lampstand in the inner courts, also known as the holy place. But in the most holy place, also known as the Holy of Holies, uh, there was divine light. It was the glory of God that was resting there, right? And it's what it says in the Bible, Exodus 25, right? I will meet with you there between the cherubs, right? So the Ark of the Covenant was God's throne on earth. Okay, and so it was... and. It is possible for us to uh, lose the significance of the tabernacle of Moses because yes, we are one, we are true, uh, we are living in the new covenant. That's one thing, and second, we speak about it so much, uh, the tabernacle of Moses and whatnot. But but when we understand, when we pause and just take time to understand. Okay, hey, this is that was like the most significant place on earth at that time. It's where humanity is meeting with divinity. That's the bridge between heaven and earth. And all the nations surrounding Israel, the people of Israel, knew that their God was with them because of the cloud that rested on the tabernacle. Right? Every nation surrounding uh, the camp of Israel knew is like not to mess with them because of his presence, because of his glory that was present there. So uh, it's, it, was, it was a beautiful sight. I'm sure it was a beautiful sight to behold, right? So the Old Testament tabernacle of Moses was a place where God met with his people and where his glory was revealed, right? Um, and why is it, again, significant to these people is, I mean, when I say these people is the people of Israel, because for 400 odd years, uh, they were in the land of Egypt, right? For 400 years, 400 years is equivalent to 10 generations, okay? How many people? We are 12 of us in this class. So <laughs> uh, imagine 10 generations uh, of not hearing the voice of God, not knowing who he is, or not you know being able to see of what he's done, uh, and 10 generations goes by 400 odd years and they are just surrounded by the idols of Egyptians. And so their idea of God is this, the gods of Egypt. 
Egyptians, right? And for them to behold such an awesome sight, and you know, when 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 the Bible says when Moses brought them out of the land of Egypt on the way to their first encounter, they saw the whole mountain is on fire and trembling, and you can imagine their anxiety levels just shooting through the roof. It's like, what is this? Is this really our God? Um, and that's why they say, it's like, okay, Moses, you know, um, you talk with him yourself. We will just listen to you. Everything we will do, everything what you tell us to do. Right? Everything is there in Exodus 19 and 20, guys. You should read it. It's, it's quite fascinating. And so the tabernacle of Moses was quite a happening place on earth at that time, I can say. Right? And then we see the same thing happening in Solomon's temple. And you can read all about it in Second Chronicles 5, 13 and 14, where the glory of the Lord filled the house uh, of God time and time again, when there was worship happening, right? All the musicians and uh, the singers, they sang to uh, together in unity and they sang for he is good, his mercy endures forever. And the house of the Lord was filled uh, with a cloud. And then, uh, and then the, you know, the, the, the temple of solomon is being is destroyed by the babylonians they go into 70 year uh, 70 years of captivity and after they are released they come back and they start rebuilding the temple in jerusalem and they they build it continuously for about 16 years before they were interrupted uh, and then haggai prophet haggai he prophesies in chapter 2 verse 7 and 9 let's come down to page 99 he says I will shake all nations and they shall come to the desire of all nations. I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Let's pause there. The silver is mine. The gold is mine. Now, that is something. Those were the precious stones uh, that was referred to. To show off a riches of those land, isn't it? And then maybe we rewind back to their revelation in chapter five. We see that word being used: all honor, power, riches, right? And the, here we see that God is saying, "The silver is mine, the God, the gold is mine," says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. We got to read that again. The glory of this latter temple, that means the, the temple that's being rebuilt after the captivity, shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Right? So here, God is promising his people that if they would build the temple, he would fill it with his glory. Right, And so the glory of God is an expression of who he is and what he does. That's, that's simply what the glory of God is in a simple definition. If you were to explain what is the glory of God, right? We talk about the weight of his glory, right? Uh, the Hebrew word when we say Shekinah glory, uh, it simply means the weight of his glory. And so when there was... Uh, a I'm not sure if you remember from a praise and worship course, we learned about the presence of God. Uh, there are two kinds of presence. One is the, his manifest presence and his omnipresence, right? That means God is present everywhere. Like in right now in my room, he's there with you. He's present with you in your part of the world, wherever you are from. It's, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. And then there are times where he decides to show up. That's his manifest presence, right? Uh, and... And so that's what the glory of God is. The glory of God is a manifestation of who God is and what he does. Right? So at the tabernacle of uh, Moses and in the dedication of Solomon's temple, uh, the glory of God was manifested as a cloud. But uh, God's glory can become tangible not only through what we see, but sometimes uh, his glory is revealed through what we sense or feel. Or when a word is spoken, when a prophetic word is released, a prophetic song is being sung, when there's healing that happens, when there's a deliverance that is uh, that happens, all of that is revealing the glory of God, of who he is. Isn't it? God is good. When there is a healing that happens, 
there's a revelation of his goodness, as a revelation of him as a healer, and that is revealing his glory. Right, and so uh, the glory of God is an expression of who He is and what He does. Right, and God desires in page hundred. God desires a people who will manifest His glory. Right, and Numbers chapter fourteen, verse twenty and twenty-one. The, the it says, "Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word." Right, this is uh, the context is uh, Moses has just interceded for the people of Israel. God wanted to destroy them all. Uh, Moses said, please don't. Uh, and then, okay, God says, I have pardoned according to your word. But truly, as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Right? So at this point, God reiterated his heart's intent. He would fulfill his original plan <clears throat> to have people through whom the whole earth will be filled with his glory. Right? His heart is to fill the whole earth with his glory. And he can, he can do that through his people. Right? So the church, and therefore every local church uh, body today, is part of this great purpose of God. To see the earth filled with the glory of God. We declare his goodness, we declare his glory, right? Every local church, wherever it's wherever it's placed, right? When we declare and when we worship, when we praise uh, you know, for who he is, what what are we doing? We are declaring the glory of God on earth. Right? All right, the next section talks about a people among whom God dwells. Uh, Psalm 132, verse 13 to 18. Now, can, can I request someone to read Psalm 132, verse 13 to 18, please, in, in the notes? Psalm chapter 132, verse 13 to 18. For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has decided it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have decided it. I will abandon it. Thanks, Jafina. Okay. Uh, can I also request another person to uh, read that scripture once again, please? Psalm 32, verse 13 to 18, in another translation, maybe NLT or NIV, maybe. Or any version that you have right now. Oh, yes, go ahead, please. Psalm 132, 13 to 18. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her food, pure, poor with bread, her priests, Priest, I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout for joy. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. Thanks, Anita. And so uh, God is making his uh, intentions very clear, right? Uh, is right there saying that here I will dwell for I have desired it right uh, another word for dwelling place is uh, tabernacle right when we say he tabernacled uh, means he dwelt among us right and so he's making it very clear that here I will dwell for I have desired it right and so and the next section we see that what happens when we bec uh, when we become a people among whom God dwells, right? If, if 
So if you're the local church, uh, you are the people among whom God is dwelling. Uh, you know, there, here are seven things that uh, God says that he will do. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. So there is supernatural provision, prosperity and blessing. Verse 16, I will also clothe her priests with salvation and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. That means there is salvation, which includes forgiveness, healing, deliverance, victory, and more. There is joy of salvation that resounds continually among us. Verse 17, there I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. There is a continual increase of strength and dominion. That's a uh, horn symbolizes strength and dominion. Okay, uh, remember that next time when you read uh, horns, like uh, if you read, if once again, if you read how all the altars in the tabernacle of Moses was designed, you would read about there has to be four horns that kind of, you know, symbolizing strength and dominion. Okay, um, there is continual revelation. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed as his anointed people will see continual increase in strength, dominion and revelation. Verse 18, his enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall flourish. We triumph over our enemies and continue to increase, flourish, and blossom as his people. So there are seven I will promises in that Psalm 132, verse 13 to 18, alone. And that is his desire. He, it's, he desires to be among us. And as if that was not good enough, he says, I will do all these things. Not maybe, not I can, not I could, not I would. I will do all these things, right? Um, so that's, that's just the beauty of God dwelling among his people. And we are called to be uh, a people where among whom God will dwell. Right? And there are so many, much, so much more in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 and 2. Uh, it's popular scripture. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and the deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Right? And uh, in that same chapter, if you go down uh, for, to verse 7, verse 9, he goes on to say, I will glorify the house of my glory. Because he has glorified you, you know, I will glorify you. I will make the place of my feet glorious. In verse 13, the Lord will be to you an everlasting light and your glory for and, uh, and your glory, your glory. Um, right. So and as a result of God's glory being present with his people uh, and, you know, he's he said that I will do all these things. Um, and then we also see signs and wonders and miracles uh, following, you know, th that reveals the glory of God, right? Um, and when we talk about it, we remember what you see what it says in John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Right, so this is what we call it as a sonship glory, right? Um, so the signs, wonders, healings, and miracles that Jesus did revealed the glory of God, right? In John chapter 2, verse 11, it says, This beginning of signs Jesus did in the Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So something about the sonship glory and doing all of these signs and wonders uh, makes people believe of who in who this God is, right? Uh, Matthew fifteen thirty one says, "So the multitude marvelled when they saw the mute speaking, the the maimed made whole, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing. They glorified the God of Israel." Right, so in in the revelation of God's glory, in the manifestation of God's glory, the response is for us to glorify the God of Israel. Right, so the sonship glory that the Lord Jesus walked in was released to the body of Christ. So the same sonship glory that Jesus walked in is released now to us, 
and we've spoke on this extensively if you remember in uh, in healing and deliverance course right so and each time we hear from the holy spirit and then follow through on what he speaks to us we reveal his glory okay each time we hear from the holy spirit and then follow through on what he speaks to us we reveal his glory right um and so what in all of this what happens what, what's the importance of glory as in why is it also important why are we talking so much about the glory of god in in in, in the church uh, right for that we need to understand what happens when we don't have the glory it's like saying okay we feel the importance of one person in their absence isn't it only after they're gone kind of a thing uh but there are a couple of episodes that happens in the old testament uh when the glory departs uh the first thing is in first samuel chapter 4 verse 21 right first samuel chapter 4 verse 21 um it says um in the notes then she named the child Ichabod, saying the glory has departed from israel because the ark of god had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband now uh the priest eli uh, you know, was old. Uh, he was the high priest at that time. He, and then his two sons were living an immoral life. They were sleeping around with women who were coming to the sanctuary. They were just living an immoral, sinful life. There was no intimacy with God. There was no reverence for God. There was no fear of God. Uh, that's the context behind First Samuel chapter 4. But then Philistines attacked and they said, uh, you know, what are we going to do? Hey, the ark of God is in Shiloh. Let's go bring the Ark of God from Shiloh. And, uh, you know, because somewhere in history they read, okay, if they take the Ark of the Covenant and put it in the front and then go, uh, they will win the war or the battle. But to their surprise, um, they didn't. They lost miserably. They lost 30,000 men that day. Israel lost 30,000 men that day. And the Ark of the Covenant was captured. Uh, that one of the darkest history uh, in the history of Israel, and that sh that news was so much sh was so shocking that Eli, the high priest, he who was hefty and you know quite big, he when he heard that news that the Ark of the Covenant had been captured, he fell off his chair, he breaks his neck, and he dies. And hearing this news, uh, his daughter-in-law goes into labor, gives birth, and he she names the son uh, Ichabod. That means the glory has departed, and she also dies. Uh, the tragedy of glory departing and that's why the significance of the, uh, behind the story of david bringing the ark back is because after this happened um, saul comes into the picture uh, as a king uh, but saul is a king uh, who is a person after position and not presence but david was a person after presence and not just position and so then he goes after the ark and brings it back. And so uh, when when glory departs, uh, it's not a great sight, um, right? And in the next section, we see uh, when God stands outside the temple, it talks about um, Israel's seventy-year Babylon cap Babylonian captivity. Now, in First Samuel chapter four, we read about the ark of the covenant being captured, and then much later, we uh, in the book of Nehemiah. Ezra, Ezekiel, all these prophets, contemporary prophets, we talk about the people of the covenant taken into captivity. So for Samuel 4, it's about Ark of the Covenant taken into captivity. And the latter, cha latter books talks about the people of the covenant taken into captivity for 70 odd years, right? Uh, and then Ezekiel chapter 8, um, let's see, Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 6, it says, Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary. Now turn again and you will see great abominations. And Ezekiel 10, 18 to 19 says, Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels were beside them, and they stood out the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of God of Israel was about them. And so, uh, I mean, I'll just kind of conclude here. 
is God is talking about these people because they had again the people of Israel, the priests. Okay, I want to highlight that the priests who were responsible to minister unto the Lord, who were in charge of worship, who were in charge of leading people into worship, they gave themselves into idolatry. Right? Idolatry in the spiritual is what adultery in the natural is. And that's how dangerous uh, idolatry is. And that's how much God detests idolatry. But then he doesn't stop there. Uh, he's been in Ezekiel 43 onwards, 4 and 7, uh, God says uh, to prophet Ezekiel that uh, in detail is showing what the new city will look like, what the new temple will look like. And that's what Ezekiel 43 verse uh, 4 to 7 uh, is all about. Uh, let me just read from verse 6 and 7 in Ezekiel 43. It says, Then I heard him speaking to me from the temple while, I, while a man stood beside me. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. No more shall the house of Israel defile my holy name they nor their kings by their by their harlotry or with the carcasses of their kings on their high places. Ezekiel 44 4. Also he brought me by, by the way of the north gate to the front of the temple. So I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple, filled the house of the Lord, and I fell on my face. Right? The local church. Uh, the body of believers referred to as the temple of God in the New Testament is the place of his throne among a community. Right? It is the place where his kingdom is manifested. The local church, right, a community of his believers, the body of his believers, it's a place where his kingdom is manifested. It's a place of the soles of his feet uh, that is the place of his dominion. Right? It's almost like us planting flags. Why, why do we use flags in worship? Is it, Flags are always used to point out a territory, right? Say, hey, this is my territory, right? Um, and so it's like us planting a flag saying, this is God's kingdom, this is God's territory. And that's the duty, the responsibility of us as priests and of us as the local church, right? God rules in and through his people. It is the place where God dwells among his people. The local church is the house filled with his glory. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll pause here, guys, um, and we'll continue uh, from next week. All right. Um, so uh, any, any thoughts or any questions? Okay, great then. Yeah, well, thank you all for joining uh, for today's session. Um, you have a great day, uh, have a blessed weekend ahead. God bless you. I'll see you all again next week. See you guys. Thank, thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you.